Hope I see you all guys there. I am Zeno Roman, publisher of the Surfcasters Journal, and you are watching Surfcasters Journal TV. Don't ever, ever listen to Billy Joel before you go fishing because you will definitely not catch fish. It's obviously, you know, really beat up. Welcome to the episode number three of SJTV, a web show designed for the surfcasters by the surfcasters. In this episode, we managed to get on some blitz of big bluefish during the Labor Day weekend out in Montauk. We also have Ray Leva and uh, Dave Anderson sharing their canal secrets and what's in their bags. We have Lou Caruso talking about a very simple tool that you, more than many of you are gonna find it very useful. And we also have John Skinner talking about what else? How to fish a bucktail. I'm Zeno Hromit for the Surfcaster Journal. It's Labor Day weekend. We're obviously not dressed for fishing. My fedora is missing. We're out in Montauk. Everybody's partying. And there's some giant bluefish out here. Uh, I had a new Vanstall VSX reel and my new favorite rod from Century, the Armalite, and a pencil popper. So, Let's see if we can shake one up. There's some really, really big bluefish here. And, uh, whoa, I'm in. Well, that didn't take long. I've seen bluefish up to about 20 pounds today. Maybe not 20, but definitely up to 18. Uh, big bluefish chasing bait all day long. So I kind of wanted to show you the insanity when the Montauk does go on. Down the beach, everybody's hooked up. Ah, nothing like a big bluefish to test your tackle. As I said, I'm not really prepared. I got a built on, I got a pencil popper, but these fish are just too much fun to catch to stay away from them. Woo! Whoa. It's about, I'm gonna say 85 degrees out right now. Sunny, not a cloud in the sky. <laughs> and bait up to wazoo. I mean, there's so much bait here. They're pushing the bait all around. A little peanut bunker, rain bait, all kinds of stuff. Here she comes. Oh my God, I snagged it in the back, no wonder. It's taking me so long. A little bluefish snagged in the back. Wow, on camera. How embarrassing that is. Ah, not a little, but still snagged in the back. No, I got it. Well, that wasn't really what I planned, but and my pliers are still in my shorts. Let's see, what do you got? Oh, it should be an easy release if nothing else. There he goes. I can't say you ever released the bluefish that easily. Not a small fish by any means, but there was some giant fish in here. I have a Yuzuri Surface Cruiser on. It's one of the old stock, not the new one with some uh, vintage patina hook that probably been sharpened when Reagan was a president. But uh, the bluefish don't seem to mind. 
long as you get a decent cast out, we should get at least a follow. A fellow right next to me here is landing a nice fish. And pencil pop was really nothing but shaking your rod and pulling up the slack. There's really no art to it. As long as you got good condition, you're just picking up the slack with this hand and shaking your rod with this hand. There's really, you don't really work to plug, the rod does all the work. Now you can, you can do this, or you can do it down here on the real seat, or you can grab it up here. Whichever one you like, whichever works for you is fine. Uh, other guys like it different ways, depending on the rod configuration, soft rod, fast rod. For the most part, I like it up here just to pick up the slack nice and easy. The other thing you gotta consider is you gotta take in consideration the speed of the current and how much slack you're going to pick up. So the faster the current, the less slack, meaning that the current does most of the work for you. Uh, this is one of those rare casts without a hit, but we'll make one more and, and we'll see what happens, if we can wake somebody up. Ah. All right, let's see. Shake it up. Come on, fishy, fishy. Come on, fishy, fishy. Come on. Let's do it. Let's do it. There we go. Nice fish. Uh, Lou Caruso just built me this rod about three months ago. This is the new Nor'easter uh, Armalite. I think this is one of those things that comes in two pieces and he fused it together. I gotta tell you, this is one of the sweetest rods I ever used. And I used a lot of rods. I'm a big fan of St. Croix. And I used lime glass before, but this, this century rod, this is my second century rod. I have a slingshot that I use for eels. But I wanted a plug-in rod, and I did not want 11. As you guys know, I blew out my elbow two years ago, and I haven't really been fishing because of it, so I wanted a shorter rod. If the fish are 200 yards out, I'm just gonna watch because I know I can't reach them, and I'm afraid of blowing out my elbow again. But this rod, really, really good. Wow, nice fish. Making me sweat. Nothing like it. Labor Day weekend. Everybody's out there in town drinking. And there's a bunch of guys here having a great time in shorts and sneakers. And of course, everybody got wet because you think you're going to go and you're not going to get your feet wet. And then you go and you release a nice fish and, and you get soaked. This is a really decent fish here. Hopefully, I can land it. A lot of weed in the water. It chokes up the line. And there's a lot of bait in here, too. I mean, you can see the bait just spraying when you're bringing a fish through. It's hooked in the mouth for a change. So here she comes. And a line of weed. There she is. Stay there. Come on. Nice fish. Nothing wrong with catching bluefish of that size. I'm exhausted. I'm Zeno Roman. I'll see you next time. Our next segment is Dave Anderson and Roy Lever talking about fishing the Cape Cod Canal. Dave's talking about particularly what's in his bag, how to fish it, and basically, you know, spilling out some secrets. People ask me a lot, what's in my canal bag? It changes a little bit now and then, but for the most part, most of the stuff stays pretty much the same. Uh, if you've read my stuff in SJ, you know that I'm not really big on color. So my colors are pretty simple, and um, I base more of my stuff on profile and size of the bait. Uh, probably my favorite plug for the canal is the uh, Guppy White 3.5 ounce pencil, or the Guppy Senior. Um, this plug does easily 75% of my damage in the canal. Uh, when they're keyed in more on the mackerel, I use the same plug just in a mackerel pattern. I do carry a lot of different guppy pencils though. I carry the three ounce version. Um, 
I'm, the color's really not that important. I usually carry this one or I carry the white one. And when they're on really small bait, like uh, juvenile herring or finger max, tinker max, I mean, I like to use the, uh, the two ounce round. Their top selling plug is the two and a half ounce flat, two and three eighths ounce flat. Um, I don't carry that one as often. I, I find this one to have a little bit more action in the tide and uh, I've done a lot of damage on it. Something else that I consider a, an essential is the Tsunami, what we call a fat shad or a deep drop shad. And this is basically a two ounce size shad, but it's got a three ounce piece of lead in it. And that helps us get down deep. And you know, we bounce that along the bottom and just as well, or just as often, we'll fish it along the edge of the ledge and just reel it real slow. And when the fish aren't showing, this thing can really call in the fish. Something else that I think is really important at the canal is a two and three eighths ounce Super Strike Popper. I usually carry at least four of them. Um, this is one, this is a color that I really like. I've had a lot of success with this when the herring are around, even when the whiting are in the canal, I've done well on this. Uh, one thing that I do that might be a little different than what other people do is I tie a, a 5 0 sidewash, which I sharpen, and I only use feathers. I don't use bucktail at all. The feathers have a lot more action, and um, I've had more than more than a handful of days where this plug was catching and nobody else around me was hooking up at all. Obviously, no, maybe not obviously. Uh, something else that's important to have if you go to the canal is the magic swimmer. I fish this right on the surface. I fish it fast. When the fish are pushing bait and showing a lot of aggression and they're in close, I throw this bait and I fish it real fast right on the surface. Uh, something that is not common in a lot of plug bags is a needlefish. Uh, this is a needlefish that I make, but all you really need is a, is a needlefish that sinks very slowly. When the whiting are in the canal, it's very, very difficult to, uh, a lot of times, to get them to hit. The whiting have a very unique signature on the surface. They create almost like a bubble trail. They stay right on the surface and they're skinny like a stick. And a needlefish just, a slow sinking needlefish just slowly guided down the tide is very often the only way to hook up and most people don't even have that idea in their repertoire. Uh, something else that's important to me, it's just another mackerel plug that has a slender profile. Sometimes the fat, pro, fatter profile of a guppy won't, won't draw strikes. <clears throat> this is a plug that I made myself just to sort of uh, replicate that skinnier size of the mackerel. Something else that I think is important um, again, when the fish aren't showing on the surface, is a savage. Uh, I like the mackerel color, I like the black and silver. This is a five ounce head, it's arrow shaped, it gets to the bottom really fast, and this tail creates a lot of vibration and draws a lot of strikes. And lastly, the stick shad. It's not something that I throw a lot. A lot of guys really love it. I throw it when I see big bait. And it's nice to have that option, especially when the big bait is in tight to shore. If you don't, there's really nothing else like it that has that profile and that lazy action. Um, it, can really, it can really get the job done when other things won't. And uh, actually, I guess there is one more. And the last thing is another thing I don't see too many guys throwing down the canal, and that's a walk the dog style plug. This is a Lemire uh, Senior Wave Jammer. It's a large plug. I like it. Just in white or bone color, I don't fuss with different colors. I'm much more interested in the action. And when the tide's moving slow or dead slack, the action on this bait will draw fish to the surface when, honestly, when nothing else will. And sort of to close out, you know, when you're fishing the canal, you really need to make sure your, your hooks are sharp, your hooks are new. You don't want rusty, you know, recovered from the Titanic hooks. Even 20 pound fish in the canal can exploit weaknesses in your gear. Never mind if you hook the fish of a lifetime and they do go through there with regularity. So before you even make a cast, you wanna make sure that everything is in tip top shape. And that way, if, if there's a failure, it's all on you. you the, the moon tides there and what they call breaking tides where you, you coincide slack with sunrise. Um, 
are always gonna, you know, throughout the season are always gonna have some, somewhat of a type of top water bite. It's visual, it's easier to fish. Um, it's almost guaranteed if you're in the right spot to, to, to hook up, you know, and your chances of catching a 40, 50, 60, even a 60 from shore on top water, it's, it's not, it's not far-fetched. Um, and that's where I would look at. I would look at those moon tides because you can look at them, you know, two years, a year down the line through a calendar and, and see those dates. Um, where it gets tricky is, is when those, those tides aren't there, but the fish are and you got to find them, you know, how, the, how they set up in rips and, and the jigging and, and, and whatever it would be to, to get them to eat. That's when it gets tough. That's, 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 that's where it separates the, the men from the boys. Next up is our regular contributor and our rod guru, Lo Caruso. He is going to show you how to tie a leader and knots with a very simple and effective tool. Hi, Lou Caruso from Surfcasters Journal. Today, I thought I'd take a minute to talk about a very subjective subject, and that's leaders. I tie my own and I use this tool called the tie fast tool. Um, I started using it a few years ago at the suggestion of one of the guys in my club and I've never looked back. Um, it's very, very, very good tool. It makes a really strong knot and it's been very effective for me. A lot of guys will say, well, I tie this knot, I tie that knot. I used to tie knots all the time and I'd have a break off every now and again. Um, was unhappy, I'd cross the leader in the middle of the night, I'd be tying and cross a knot, making a weak point. If this is used correctly, you'll never have that weak point. And as you can see, we have two of them here. I have the medium size and I have this smaller one. I happen to use the smaller one all the time. I tie 60 pound leaders on this and I've never had an issue with it. Both of them work, both of them work fine. You can go online, you can find them as cheap as six, seven bucks. They all work. So I thought I'd show you what I actually do to tie a leader, and you can make your own choice. What I do is over the winter, I'm sitting there watching the boob tube, nothing really to do. I'll pull out my, my uh, leader material, my clips, my swivels, and I'll tie up a dozen in a night. Just put them on the side. No real issues. It doesn't get monotonous. And by the time the season comes, I have a pretty good supply. It usually lasts me all season with no problem. So let's take a look and see how to actually use this tie fast tool. You can also find all the information you need on using the tie fast and how to tie these knots on YouTube. There's quite a few of them out there. It's very informative. The first few I did, I was all thumbs the knots didn't come out good. Now it's second nature. The one thing I will say when you use this tool is don't chintz on your leader material. If you're doing a four foot leader, don't do four foot six inches and try and do three inches at the end. It doesn't pay and it doesn't work. You'll do nothing but frustrate yourself. All right, let's take a look at how this is done. So I have 60 pound mono. Like I said, I usually just Take a piece off. All right, the first end I'll tie, I'll tie it up on a clip. I use clips, again, subjective. Some guys use different clips than this. Um, there's a lot of talk about guys saying that the clips open up on them. What I found is that if you don't tie this knot tight enough, it'll have a tendency if a bass gets leverage on you, It'll twist and the knot will slide down and now it's going to pull right open on you. So what we've done in the club, a couple of guys came up with the idea, put a drop of crazy glue when you're all done and it stops that sliding around. It makes it 100% tighter. I've never had one twist on me. Then again, I don't catch a lot of big fish. so. That could be the reason why too. All right, so I've taken the, fit, the tie fast and I put a little clip on it. And the reason I do that is I can now quickly put my clip on there and it holds it tight. 
what I'll do is I'll take the other end of it, and this is important because if you don't do this, you have a chance of crossing your knots. I take this and I just put it under my foot to hold it tight. You can do it any way you want. Some of the guys put a nail on their bench to keep pressure on the line, whatever it takes. All right, so you take the, the end that you have taut and you put it in the little slot here. Then you take your other end and again, make sure you leave enough. Because if you don't, what happens is you're all thumbs trying to get this pulled through. All right, also put that in the slit, run it around four, five times. Make sure that it's behind your other line. Three, four, I'll do this one five times just to show. With 60 pound leader, they say you can actually go three twists. I do four and I don't have a problem. Now you take the end, put it in that same channel, very much like a nail knot. All right, now here's the trick to making sure that this all stays tight for you. Pull pressure, squeeze your knot, and then grab it and pull it off. As you can see, it makes a perfect knot. Now I lubricate it. Pull it tight. Take your tag end. Some guys use pliers on that. I pull it tight. Clip your tag off. And again, this is where you're gonna put a drop of crazy glue on here to keep it locked in here. I've, did a lot of, I've done a lot of experimentation with this and I've never been able to snap this knot in all the years I've been fishing it. Never been able to actually snap, snap it. I usually wind up cursing a lot when I hang up on structure and I'm trying to get a plug or a bucktail back because these won't let loose. What usually happens is the knot on the other end of my swivel will let go before this does. Again, put some pressure on it and pull it off. You can see, perfect knot again. Lubricate it, you're good to go. Now this is for guys that use a clip, use a swivel. As I said, I haven't had any issues with it. It's another weapon in your arsenal if you so decide to try. Good luck out there. Talk to you soon. No one has done more to increase the popularity of using the bucktails in recent years than fisherman extraordinaire John Skinner. From his books on fishing the bucktail, Striper Pursuit, and Season of the Edge, to his videos on YouTube and seminars speaking, he has kind of pushed the bucktail really in the forefront where a lot of guys are using it more than they ever did. At least I feel that way. So let's uh, listen to John share his feelings on bucktails. For choosing bucktails, if you had nothing else but smiling bill heads, you'd be just fine, all right? So, you know, there's the one thing. And then the other thing, the big mistake I see is most anglers um, that are inexperienced with bucktails, they go too heavy. So the, the things to think about are um, the water depth, uh, the sweep or current, and, and the waves. And um, if you think about, like, these open beaches here, your longest cast with a bucktail. If you're going to hit 12 feet of water, that's a deep spot, at least for these Long Island beaches. A lot of times, you're casting into much less water than that, you know, maybe six to eight feet, and uh, sometimes less than that. So I want to, uh, my objective that I've written about a thousand times and talked about is to swim the bucktail near the bottom on a slow to moderate retrieve. And I know that if I'm casting into eight feet of water and I have very little current and just moderate wave action, yeah, three quarters to one ounce is going to do the job. Now, in the inlets, that's a lot more technical. And you know, you're dealing with depth, uh, deeper water, stronger current. But again, you get a feel for it. And you know, one thing you can do if you go to a spot, you're not familiar with it, you know, make a cast and then feel how long it takes that jig to settle to the bottom. You know, if it takes 15 seconds to settle to the bottom, well, you may be not going to be able to fish there. It's so deep. If it settles to the bottom in like 
you know, eight seconds or so, yeah, okay, yeah, that's not too bad. And that gives you an idea of how deep it is. And then from there in the inlets, you know, most of the time you're in that two to four ounce range. A lot of times you're in the two to three ounce range. Um, you know, and again, it's about hitting that objective of swimming it close to the bottom, slow to moderate retrieve. Hi, my name's Craig Cantelmo with Van Stahl. And where we're standing right now, I grew up about 15 miles away on this stretch of beach on the North Fork. And I've lived through the first crash of the striped bass back in the late 70s, early 80s, where we were fishing these beaches every day. And we saw where there were huge schools of fish. And then we went through some years that were pretty lean. And it's kind of reminiscent of where we are today with that population. And I'm fortunate where I could travel from the tip of Cape Cod all the way down to the Carolinas, visiting dealers and talking to consumers and have a pretty good feel about where we are today. And even though that population of fish is small, there's still some areas of great fishing. But what you see is that I think we're experiencing the days of 2006 where we had millions more fish where they had to spread out and be in every nook and cranny and every bay and along every shoreline just because competition kind of forced them to be there to find food. They've now kind of grouped up into these mega schools. So you'll get exceptional fishing in one area and poor fishing in others. But what's happened too now with social media and other avenues to get information is everyone kind of knows where those fish are. So that's a double-edged sword for the fish because there's a lot more pressure when the guys find them, but it also allows anglers to get access to those fish. So, which is great, and that's why we all do it, and we want to have fun and catch them. But at the same term, time, we want to conserve that resource. And what I'd like to say is that, and thanks to Surfcasters Journal and a bunch of other organizations that got together to change the regulations on striped bass last year, so we only get to keep one um, in all, all, all the states in the Northeast except for one. So where we are with the striped bass fishery, we go and we change the regs to one fish in all the states except for one in the Northeast because we want to conserve this fishery and then we regulate it to harvest. But the real issue with the striped bass is not that we're harvesting more as anglers, it's that they're not being successful spawning in the Chesapeake Bay where they say more than 90% of the migratory fish come from that go all the way up to Maine. So I think we, we have to start to look at the cause of the decrease in the population and then look at water quality in the Chesapeake Bay and push our legislators to kind of look at that and not just regulate the fish by the number of fish we harvest, but try to protect that resource and where they're spawning so that more fish are recruited into that migratory uh, fishery. And I think we're all gonna be better. But remember, conserve the resource, have fun, and take your time and release those fish. A lot of these people never saw blitzes like that. Where they're bigger fish. They might have seen a lot of bluefish blitz, but not bass blitz. The bass, when you are on the beach and then you're looking over at the rocks and you see fish making up and the water boiling and they're coming down towards you. You ever notice that the people chase fish? And if you stay there, the fish are going to come to you. But any time you catch a nice fish, you know, you like to share, you like to show it off. I would say a 20, 30 pounder. You know, you put them on a string and you bring it up to the parking lot. You drag it. You hook it on your back. But see, the whole thing is, is uh, like when you're down on a beach and there's a lot of people there. You whack a 30, 40 pound bass and you hold it up and you release it. And you throw it back in. These guys said, what are you doing? What are you doing? They're so fucking excited. Seeing a big fish, you're throwing it back in. And you know, you look at them like, you know, you're a jerk. Let it go. You know, like it's a nothing thing. 
you know, no matter if they're teen fish or 30 pounders, you know, uh, as long as you're in there and you're getting the action, that's what counts, you know. I'm just a basic fisherman. I don't have a lot of fancy spancy plugs. You know, I'm basic. I'm a super strike, super strike, super strike Gibbs, you know. A couple other plugs thrown in there, like a Bob Hahn, you know. I don't really have the $70 plugs unless you're counting the old Musso metal lips. Hopefully this will give me enough to reach those fish over there. Looks like I'm in the right spot. Let's see what happens. It's fish breaking, and I'm in. He went out, went fishing. He cast it the first time, and the rod folded over. And he always brings two rods. He put the rod in the truck, came back with the second rod, cast it, that rod folded over in the exact same spot. Uh, I do have an affection for really large plugs, which is my nighttime bag for large plugs and large bait. These I love on the south side. Same thing, I go all darters pretty much. Um, I have special plugs made by uh, Sporting Wood with a really big darters. These are almost two inches in diameter, weigh about four ounces. 